Good morning, everyone. My name is Melissa Stuckey, and I am a professor of history at Elizabeth City State University. And um, let me just check one thing really quickly, and then we'll get started. I'm just going to mute and turn off my camera for a sec. All right, good morning all. We just wanted to check on a technical thing before we got started to make sure we were all able to hear each other. It's so great to see the number of participants and see all these greetings in the chat. I expect today to be a very lively, 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 lively conference, mini conference. Um, so welcome to the third week of Elizabeth City State University's annual Black History Month celebration. And uh, today we are beginning part one of a mini conference on African American cemetery preservation. We've got experts from across the state who will be guiding us through one aspect of African American cemetery preservation, specifically maintenance and cleaning of headstones. Uh, there are so many other elements that go into African American cemetery preservation and uh, you should expect over the course of the year or the next year or so that there will be other groups in North Carolina that will be working together to share some of their experiences in African American cemetery preservation. But we're super proud to be uh, amongst the first to, to get this going. We've been working closely with the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources for over a year. Uh, you know, obviously because of COVID, we've had to make adjustments, but we're really excited to finally get going. I'm gonna start just by acknowledging a few folks at Elizabeth City State University who have made this possible and uh, giving you a sense of what to expect over the course of the rest of the day uh, or the rest of this hour and a half or so that we'll be together. Uh, first, I would like to thank our university's uh, academic affairs. So uh, Provost Farrah Ward, Dean Sharon Rayner, uh, our department chair, uh, Dr. China Crawford, uh, Ms. Ella Holly, who is our um, incredible administrative uh, superwoman, my colleagues in the history program, and uh, our history scholars club. So I hope that we see a few of them uh, here as well. And especially want to thank the city of Elizabeth City and their parks and recreation department, which is responsible for the care of the cemetery that we will be working uh, to clean headstones in. Um, they've been very responsive and enthusiastic and I imagine that some of them will be uh, participants as well in, in learning a little bit more about how to care and maintain uh, our historic cemeteries in the city. Um, so now I'm going to give you an order of operations so you have a sense of what we'll be doing over the course of this next hour and a half and then introduce our speakers. So expect first that you'll get a welcome from Ms. Angela Thorpe who is the director of the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. Uh, you'll then get uh, a, a short talk on the historic and social significance of African American cemeteries by my colleague, Dr. Latif Tariq at ECSU in history. We will then have a headstone cleaning lesson from Ms. Melissa Timo, who is uh, in the Office of State Archaeology and that will be followed by a, um, a preparation for the day lesson by Miss um, Jessica Kosmas, who is at the Museum of the Albemarle in Elizabeth City. And that will give you all kinds of tips for just making sure that when, whenever you go to the cemeteries in your home, uh, in your hometowns, that you are, uh, you know, experiencing best practices and being mindful of the, of the, of the location, which is gonna vary. So we actually took a trip out together on Wednesday to get a lay of the land of what was going on in our area, which is really important because we've been experiencing 
a month of rain. <laughs> so that was really important for us to get a sense of what the ground was like. Um, and speaking of a month of rain, we've just had two more days of nonstop rain. So we have decided to care for our cemetery by not going to do a headstone cleaning practicum on Saturday. We're going to wait till we have a few days of dry weather so that we are not harming the cemetery. I went out this morning and the conditions were definitely deteriorated from what they were two days ago when Jessica and I went out there and the thought of, of 15 to 20 people walking around did not seem like a good idea at all. And I don't think that we would be very comfortable on our knees in saturated ground. So we will postpone that um, I do want, however, if there's anyone, um, those of you who are local and participants, if you could put your name and contact information either in a private email to me or to Dr. Reed, or if you want to put it in the chat, you're welcome to do so. You can chat it to us privately or publicly, however you feel comfortable. So if you're interested in knowing that future date when they'll go out. We're really excited about this headstone cleaning portion of the conference. Uh, it'll be a very good way to practice and to also contribute to the work of uh, maintaining that cemetery that we have. Uh, it's a historic cemetery. Uh, there are headstones and graves of uh, US Civil War veterans, the founder of Elizabeth City State University uh, and many other folks. So we want to do our best to not further harm and also to help. So we're gonna make sure that the conditions are our best for us to be able to do that. Now I'm going uh, to start by introducing our panelists. Angela Thorpe. Ms. Angela Thorpe is a military brat whose roots are tied to the small tobacco farming community of Pine Tops, North Carolina. Angela returned to her roots after receiving a BA in history with a minor in African-American studies at the University of Florida. She pursued a master's in history with a concentration in museum studies from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Here, she began her quest to connect black communities and their stories to diversity of heritage spaces. Angela joined the North Carolina African-American Heritage Commission as associate director in 2017 before being hired as director in 2019. Prior to this, she worked at President James K. Polk's State Historic Site in Pineville, North Carolina, and at the History Makers Video Oral History Archive in Chicago, Illinois. Now, Dr. Latif Tariq. Latif A. Tariq works as assistant professor of history and serves as history program coordinator at Elizabeth City State University. Dr. Tariq is the book review editor for the Southern Conference on African-American Studies, uh, Incorporated's journal, The Grio. His publications include journal articles, book chapters, and the digital humanities. Dr. Tariq teaches general education history, Africana studies, and public history. Melissa Timo joined the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology in April 2019 as the Historic Cemetery Specialist. Originally from southwestern Pennsylvania, she obtained her BS in Anthropology and Archaeology from Mercyhurst University in Erie, Pennsylvania. She received her MA in Historical Archaeology with an emphasis on public archaeology from the University of West Florida in Pensacola, Florida. Her master's thesis focused on the maintenance, memory, tradition, and cultural landscape by examining a 19th century African-American cemetery in Bay County, Florida. Before coming to OSA, Melissa worked in a wide variety of archeology, span public archeology, span and public history jobs across the Eastern United States. Her real passion lies in connecting people to their local history, historic cemeteries, and archeological resources. Finally, Jessica Cosmas currently works as a collections specialist for the Museum of the Albemarle here in Elizabeth City. 
She, since graduating from Bryn Mawr College with a BA in the history of art, Jessica has taken on several different roles at the museum and galleries across the United States. From customer service to collections care, Jessica loves the versatility found in the museum environment. Jessica has previously studied under Monuments Conservator Jonathan Apple and worked with him in preserving historic cemeteries in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, these are my kind of people. So I am so excited to hear your collective wisdom. And, you know, I, I know that this work that is just beginning, that was very clear to me as the number of registrants to the conference grew and grew and grew that this is the beginning, not the end of our partnership. So I'm so excited for that. I'm so excited to bring more of our students on and give them a sense of the variety of careers possible with humanities degrees and affiliates because we do claim archaeology even though it's in the BS area. Uh, so for history, et cetera, et cetera. We're super excited to have you all here. Um, folks, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. We will uh, be maintaining um, a pretty tight timetable so that we can make sure that we are within a reasonable amount of time today. Uh, so there'll be about five minutes after Dr. Tariq speaks for you to ask questions in the Q&A again, and I'll read them out loud. Uh, and then after uh, Melissa and Jessica speak, there'll be another 10 to 15 minutes for you to ask questions of each of them. And um, since that'll be pretty much the end, we can go on a little bit longer after that. But I just want to make sure that you have an opportunity to hear our great speakers and to learn from them in a timely manner. And then we can, you know, be at our leisure towards the end for anyone who wants to hang out afterwards. So uh, for, uh, with all that being said, I'm going to uh, hand this over to Ms. Angela Thorpe for our welcome and ask that uh, all the other participants, myself included, turn off their cameras. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I will begin by saying welcome again. I am so delighted to see how many people are joining us from all over the country. Uh, we've got folks from cemetery preservation groups to world history uh, classes, third graders, and so welcome to all who are joining. When I think of African American cemeteries and African American burial grounds, I think of my own family cemetery in Edgecombe County, North Carolina. In it, many of my ancestors are buried, including a relative who did not live to see his 21st birthday for he was killed in the Vietnam War. Another relative who I remember during my childhood, I never heard, heard her speak. And I later learned that that was in part due to the depths of her grief. Another relative is buried in that cemetery who tilled and stewarded the land of my father's childhood, a large tobacco farm. Now that cemetery is much closer to a major highway than I am comfortable with. This is the nature of how our landscapes have changed and the ways that we value African-American people, land, and their bodies reflected again in those very landscapes. And I say all this to say that my story is not unique and in fact, it is all too common. And we see other stories um, throughout our state and, and frankly, throughout the country. If we think about how families have moved and migrated, perhaps for love, perhaps for safety, perhaps for what they perceived would be a better life, we have to think about what those black families might've left behind, including cemeteries where their ancestors and their loved ones are buried. What then is the fate of those cemeteries? Imagine living in a town where cemeteries are well stewarded, perhaps except the ones that your ancestors are buried in, 
because they are black. That is a story that I see or a reality that I see all too often in the state of North Carolina. And I could go on and on about the challenges that African-American burial grounds and cemeteries suffer in our state and beyond. And again, these realities, unfortunately, um, are not unique and they are widespread. With that in mind is why the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission, of which I'm director, decided to try to begin the work of taking action to, at least on the surface, address these challenges in the state of North Carolina. The North Carolina African American Heritage Commission holds as its mission to preserve, promote, and protect North Carolina's African-American history, arts, and culture for all people. And that work shows up in a number of different ways, including like what you are seeing today. In fact, in 2019, I joined with my colleagues at the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology to begin thinking through how we, as a team, could begin filling gaps as it related to African American cemeteries and burial grounds in our state. And I'll note that this work has been slow going, it's been tedious, but we are beginning to see some of the fruits of our labor and we're very excited about that. I'll also note that certainly resources are limited, but we wanted to operate from a place of abundance rather than deficit. And immediately we recognized that it would be critical to our efforts to activate the passions and the expertise that were already present in communities across the state of North Carolina to move this work forward. So with that in mind, we have tapped people and communities across that, the state, whether those are students and university faculty, whether they're local heritage groups or local activists, to help us in this work. We have uh, connected with these groups to think about how can we connect local groups to the expertise of people like Melissa and Jessica and others who study, research, and preserve burial grounds of all types to activate what we are thinking could possibly be a movement in our state. We are doing this work really as a means to create conversations, strategy sessions, workshops, and resources, all centered around helping people across the state better steward and preserve and document African American cemeteries and burial grounds in the state of North Carolina. So I will note, this is the first of what we hope are several sessions that you will see from the African American Heritage Commission and from the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology. But I will also note that this is not the only conversation that is taking place in the state. And we're certainly not the only group leading this fantastic work. There are groups from Asheville to New Bern and everywhere in between who are doing this work. I see some in the chat. Again, Friends of Gear Cemetery, the Periwinkle Society, led by Mr. Brown, so many groups who are doing this work across the state. And so ultimately, what I'm hoping you all will take away from today is on one hand, education, but on another hand, inspiration for what might be possible in a community, in a state or a country that you are located in. So again, I'm so grateful that you all are joining with me today. I also want to thank the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology for their commitment to this work, Elizabeth City State University, most especially Dr. Stuckey and Dr. Tariq, who um, have been with us on this journey for the better part of a year and some change. We're so happy to be here finally. The Museum of the Albemarle, and finally, the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. Thank you all.
Thank you so much, Angela. That was really moving. Uh, and I think that so many of us, we love this and we care about this because of those personal attachments in your story about, you know, the idea of migration and how that does impact um, cemeteries losing uh, the folks who would, who would be the caregivers in terms of future generations. Uh, and and there, we just, we're in a moment when people are coming back and wanting to, having the ability, I would say, to take care of those ancestral grounds and, to, and wanting to protect them and wanting knowledge about how to do that. So we are at, you know, we're at the cusp, we're at the forefront of, of that space and that movement. And I'm really thankful for your leadership, for your vision, and for your, uh, what I call patience and persistence for us to make sure that this finally happened. Um, next up, we're gonna have Dr. Latif Tariq. So if you could turn on your camera and Dr. Tariq is going to give us a little bit about uh, the historic and social significance of African-American cemeteries. That particular, um, that will be followed by five minutes of Q&A for Dr. Tariq. So if you have questions for Dr. Tariq, you can uh, put those in the Q&A and we'll do a moderated Q&A for a few minutes after he speaks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tariq. I'll just mute and take off my camera. Hi, good morning to everybody. I am Latif Tariq, Assistant Professor of History and Program Coordinator here at Elizabeth City State University. So today, what I'm gonna do is kind of bridge almost a 400 year span and how we got here today to discuss the importance of African-American cemeteries. I'm gonna use three primary sources on um, protecting our shared heritage in African-American cemeteries by Lynn Rainville, anthropologist, work of Michael Blakely, works on the African-American burial ground, connection to the African-American cemetery movement, and William Montague Cobb, father of the physical anthropology and African-American preservation. So you gotta kind of think about the concept of zooming the black body and maintaining agency of the black body, both in life and in death. So if we think about our enslaved ancestors who came from Africa, they always did not have a choice on where they could be buried, how they were gonna be buried, and all of the agency and burial rights that go along with the African retentions of, of the burial rights that they brought with them in the adaptation of American burial rights as well. But I'm gonna actually start in the most modern time and that is in the year 1991. So in 1991, the United States government in Lower Manhattan began to break ground for a new federal building or in addition to a federal building. They had to dig about 30 feet in the ground in order to really break ground and set the foundation. What they came across is what is now considered the oldest African burial ground known to us in the United States, 6.6 .6 acres. During this time period between the 1700s and 1800s, over 15,000 African Americans was buried in that burial ground in, in Lower Manhattan. So, you have to go back to this time period in which um, thinking about African-American burial, they were not allegated public space. So cemeteries and African-American cemeteries is about the allocation of space as well. Um, so during the 17 and 1800s, they was given this burial ground by the local community, which was outside of the city limits. Then in the 1900s, that burial ground was covered up and it was not uncovered until 1991. So when they excavated that site, it was about 400 individuals that was assumed and the New York African burial ground was born. However, at this time, because it was federal property, when you look at the African-American cemeteries and cemeteries in general in the United States, we have very inconsistent public policies on cemeteries. However, the federal government has very consistent policies on their cemeteries and historical sites. So at that time, they had to do the research on that site. That research or the person that read, led that research was a gentleman who now works at William Mary. His name is Michael Blakely. Michael Blakely was the director of the 
um, anthropology department at the time at Howard University. And he was the director of constructing the African Burial Ground project. So they took the 400 remains that they could find and they took that to Howard University to start doing all the necessary research on those skeletal systems and all aspects of sampling the soil, they took it there. The question would be, why did they take it there? One of the reasons they took it there is because of, man, because of a man by the name of William Montague Cobb. Dr. Cobb is considered the generation that is considered the father of physical anthropology in the United States. He also is one of the first recognized, certified, Black anthropologists in the United States as well. Dr. Cobb started off in physical anthropology and, and he believed, I'm sorry, he started off in medical anthropology, but then he believed that you did not have to have a medical degree to be an anthropologist. Dr. Cobb also came into anthropology during the time of social Darwinism. So one of the things that Dr. Cobb did with anthropology is to dismiss the myths of social Darwinism and racism in the United States. Uh, and he was a very, very um, accomplished man. I would tell you to go to the carresearch.com um, online to look up his further work. But if you look at Dr. Cobb's dissertation, a mass survey of anthropological materials and methods, documentation, processing and preservation. It is Dr. Cobb at the earliest point that began to lay out the methodology in terms of African-American burial grounds. So in order to do that, Dr. Cobb used the immediate cemeteries around Washington, DC in which he was raised and born, right? So Dr. Cobb was able to go and he was able to um, exhume skeletons to be able to um, dismiss some of the social Darwinism cranial studies. Um, they also had studies on athletes like Jesse Owens. Um, one of the myths that the Nazi regime put out that the reason Jesse Owens was so successful in the 1932 Olympics because he had part animal genes and all of those things. So Dr. Cobb uses anthropology as well to overturn racial myths. But most importantly, one of his accomplishments is considering what some call Black anthropology. And that is basically using anthropology in terms of understanding um, the African-American material conditions. And he did it in the form of being able to set up the foundation in terms of doing research and methodologies in terms of burial grounds. One of the things that Dr. Carr was able to do was create a collection of 700 African-American skeletons, 900 anatomical records on individuals, excavated bodies for research. This is why the remains from the African burial ground was taken to Howard University and was charged with the research preservation and restoration project under his former student, Dr. Michael Blakely. We also need to include two other individuals who also helped um, Dr. Cobb, maybe not directly, but certainly indirectly. And one would be Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner, father of Gullah Studies in terms of South Carolina. We can go to South Carolina and we can see inscriptions on headstones, um, directional positioning of headstones, particularly within the enslaved Muslim community who were brought from Africa and parts of the Caribbean who was buried there in South Carolina. So the student of Lorenzo Dow Turner, also we have to give credit to Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston was a cultural anthropologist. Um, and that is important because she was able to document the, the everyday living culture of Black people in the South. So this give us the first generation of anthropologists. And one of the things as I was doing this research, I was thinking about 
I cannot name, I'm sure they're out there, but I do not know a popular black archeologist um, with the, that is lettered per se, okay? Um, we do have Tony Browder who does a lot of excavations in Egypt in terms of the tombs there, but in terms in the academic record in, in the African-American community, I do not know a direct black archeologist, but we do have this genealogy of black anthropologists. So I'm going to switch to another article here. And the name of this article is called Protecting Our Shared Heritage in African-American Cemeteries. Um, and, and in order to understand this, we need to understand why we need to do this. And that is the slave population usually was marked in unmarked graves, right? And because of that, many of the graves are actually going to be lost and they're not going to be recorded in the United States Geodactyl Survey, Maps and Protocol D, which help to protect um, the rights of those cemeteries. Now, Dr. Bowman already proposed a, a question. And the question is, do you need a permit to go to cemeteries to do any type of restoration work? And honestly, I cannot answer that. And the reason is because across 50 states, all the way down to the local um, municipalities, there are inconsistent policies that regulate cemeteries. We have it at the federal level, but we do not have it at the state level. Now, for, for most African Americans, the cemetery has a great significance, and it also have great ties directly to their family and their community. So when we get to the urbanization of America, we get the more modern city type cemeteries, but we also need to be accountable for the cemeteries that we cannot see, the ones that are off the roads that are in the woods, the ones that have been lost because family members are no longer connected directly to their, to their family plots. Um, cemeteries is a matter of understanding public space. And within this public space, we need to have a public record that is regulated by local, state, and national government. The majority of the databases that are available are by people who have a direct interest in creating these databases, but the databases may not necessarily be connected to any larger institutions. Um, looking at the African burial ground movement. Now, we are the ones who have now inherited the movement that started with Dr. Cobb to the African burial ground to where we are right now. So I am from Portsmouth, Virginia. So we have very old cemeteries. Last year, during Memorial Day, I went to Lincoln University, which is our second oldest cemetery. It, there are parts of that cemetery that look the same as Oak Grove Cemetery in um, Elizabeth City. And in Portsmouth, we do not know who the custodian of the cemetery belonged to. The church who has the unofficial custodianship was gifted the cemetery from a private owner. The city doesn't seem to want to take any responsibility for the cemetery overall. So there's still a ongoing lawsuit in terms of who's going to be the custodianship of that cemetery. These are the type of issues that we're faced with, with undocumented cemeteries. So you have to look at the aspect of having property deeds, um, having a professional geodactyl survey, um, adding, to, adding the cemeteries to some type of um, geographical information system, the GIS system. All right, and being able to understand why we need individuals trained in the professional maintenance of cemeteries. Now, in a de facto way, the majority of the black cemeteries used to be under the custodianship, either a church or a civic organization or some type of small community group who had direct ties with those 
burial ground. But what happened when those individuals age out and what happened when um, they are no longer able to physically take care of those cemeteries? So I have about a minute and 50 left. So I'm gonna try to cover some of this information here. So one, we need to continue to think about laws and think about ways of preserving and creating methodologies and preservation in terms of archival research, interactive websites, and making sure that we are creating databases for these websites, um, for those cemeteries. Now, let's think about law enforcement. Um, Virginia did pass the Virginia SB 766 bill. I don't know what bill they may actually have in North Carolina, but we need law enforcement to prevent individuals from vandalizing these public spaces. Uh, people like to go and turn over headstones. They like to take things from the cemetery. They like to go use these plots for graffiti and all other types of vandalism. The last portion that I will stop with is the process of education. We need to educate the public as well as create programs in public history, anthropology, history and general archeology span so that way people can understand the importance of burial grounds and cemeteries as being public space to be respected. So one of the books that I use in my class is the um, Interpreting African-American History and Culture and Museums and Her Historical Sites. And one of the essays that I have them read in a book is called Imagining Slave Square, Resurrecting History Through Cemetery Research and Interpretation. If we don't have people trained in the field, then we cannot set public policy that will ultimately change the conditions of how these cemeteries are treated. Now, that is my timer, I'm gonna end with this. Now, um, I was a little bit surprised when I found out that the cemetery in Elizabeth City was connected to parks and recreation. I did not necessarily understand why it would be there, right? But I'm sure they had a very good reason in terms of the local government putting the cemetery there. So we need to even create or see where the best place it would be for African American cemeteries to be maintained throughout the United States of America and particularly in the state of North Carolina. And I will stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Tariq. You have absolutely, um, there's, you've generated uh, lots of questions and comments. So um, some of them I'm gonna ask you to just type in, for example, some of your bibliography folks are wanting to know. So after our Q&A, you can do that. Uh, so Nicholas Levy asks, so glad Dr. Tariq has raised the question of property ownership in the cemetery preservation context. Obviously the specific situation of individual cemeteries will vary, but are there resources for best practices about what should be done in case of unknown ownership? That is to say, formally registered as unknown in public records. I would say the best thing for that would be to go to your city manager and see if you could find the land deeds or go to a, a, the local archives and see, can you find the land deeds and ownership records and see who's supposed to have custodianship of that particular cemetery. And it's very hard because what happens over time is that the people who really cared about these cemeteries, they, they, what they did was maintain the physical maintenance of it but they didn't necessarily set up the documentation in terms of infrastructure to track when these properties will change hands. And I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite sure what the regulation or legislation would be on private property versus public domain. And I know that this is, has become a very common issue. I do know in the city, of Chesapeake, the seat of Chesapeake adopted in the Bells Mills community, which is one of the oldest African-American Civil War um, sites where, where the city adopted it. 
And they took on the responsibility of saying, hey, this is a cultural um, site of the city. And they made, they maintained that site. However, um, Dr. E. Curtis Alexander, who is about 82, 83 years old, it is his community who initially always maintained that particular um, cemetery. So I would say you would have to get your, your, your local government involved and see how you could track down those ownership rights and see what the legislation and the laws would be in your local area along with the state law. Because I know we have people here from Mississippi. Um, I know some people from South Carolina and I know they all have some of the same very issues that we have here in the region of Virginia and North Carolina. I would also say that since we do have folks from, we actually have, it's an international audience. I know there's at least one person here from Canada. So hello from the US to Canada. Uh, so definitely reach out to, uh, you know, to reiterate what uh, Dr. Tariq said, to your local uh, officials, uh, city, county, state, or however else that is organized, but also to um, thinking about the state. Uh, the Office of State Archaeology, where Melissa is works from, could be a great resource for all people. Um, if you are not getting what you need out of the local, they may be able to help you kind of negotiate that to get information, but also just may have really important information about laws, et cetera. So, and I think that um, this next question might be one that I'll save for Melissa from that perspective, since it's pretty technical about um, about trying to identify uh, where burial sites may have been moved to. So with that being said, thank you so much, Dr. Tariq. Uh, there are quite a few, there's uh, questions about some of your sources. So if you could either jump on chat or jump into the Q&A and respond to some of those questions, that would be really helpful. And if you could turn off your camera and uh, we'll bring up Melissa Timo. Okay, so Melissa Timo is uh, again from our Office of State Archaeology, and she will start us into a conversation about how to clean headstones. Uh, again, feel free to continue to interact in the chat and the questions if you have things for Dr. Lati or Dr. Tariq or for Angela, but we'll move into the practical of the headstone cleaning. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm with the Office of State Archaeology. Um, I am definitely a person that you can reach out to if you do have questions about North Carolina Cemetery Law. Uh, we have a web page that I'm going to post at the end that uh, we have our current one, but we're going to put up a new one very, very shortly um, where you can get some frequently asked questions about access and what's protected and what's not. Um, because there are it's different everywhere, like Dr. Trigg said, but we do have laws in North Carolina that might answer some of these questions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen because uh, it, everything's better with pictures. There. All right, so what I'm covering today is sort of the um, nitty gritty of cleaning headstones and why, and things you should consider before you start your efforts. Uh, jumping into headstone cleaning is uh, very exciting and it's uh, recently blown up on TikTok of all places. Um, so, but there are definitely considerations because these are, uh, cultural and heritage resources. And cultural and heritage resources, archeological resources are non-renewable resources. So it's really important that you stop and think before you bring, before you start any historic preservation effort um, because uh, there could be very lasting consequences if you don't approach it thoughtfully. So first of all, we have to think about should you even be cleaning in the first place? Uh, it's, it seems very satisfying, especially if you saw that lady on TikTok who always chooses nice white pretty marble markers that clean up very well and it seems very doable and it is uh, uh, among the historic preservation practices in the cemetery. Cleaning is one of the ones that I like to introduce the public to because it is something that is doable and it's relatively easy uh, for all different types of folks. Um, but it's not always going to produce 
uh, the, the expected results. So think first, for example, the, the pictures you see on the screen now, the one on the right is actually clean, uh, but because of the stone and different uh, natural environment considerations, it's, you ha your expectations have to be addressed and adjusted, which means I always suggest people doing a lot of research before they start their historic preservation efforts at their local cemetery. So the first thing to do is to consider, is there a uh, pressing or safety concern before you start this? Um, there are stones can be made of materials or in places where the natural environment or the community that's surrounding it um, means that the stones aren't in the best, consider the best state. So looking at that before you begin, because it might not actually be a good idea to clean in the first place. Um, also think about when the last time the cemetery was clean. Um, the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, which is a National Park Service organization, they're sort of the clearinghouse of information about preservation and the best practices in the United States. Um, they recommend only cleaning cemeteries every two to five years. Uh, you kind of think of headstones much like your teeth. You have to treat them very gently and with things that will help preserve them because they can't be uh, rebuilt. So also you have to look at is the stone itself stable? If it's vandalized, if it's leaning very badly, if the stone material itself is starting to wear away, probably not the best idea to clean it until you can get a consultant in to look at stabilizing it before you begin your efforts. Also, you wanna make sure this is something that you have the skills to do. Either you go through a workshop, you look up resources, um, never attempt something that you aren't 100% sure you can do. This is not a, a case where you can wing it and hope for the best because even little things can create long-term impacts on headstones uh, that we can never replace. So some of these damages that I'm talking about are can be internal or external forces. Uh, if you have stones that are things like uh, sandstone or slate, uh, the sort of sedimentary type rocks, we see things like spalling where you may see um, bits of the rock pop off due to environment and the conditions of the stones themselves. The lamination is when that sedimentary stone starts to, uh, the layers of the sedimentary rocks start to separate. There's also sugaring when the, which is basically, almost think of it like marble rust. Uh, it's the, that protective outside patina of a marble headstone is eaten away, whether that be natural forces, acid rain, people using bleach, and it leaves this sort of powdery surface. And that basically opens the stone up to erosional forces. Iron jacking that you see on the right-hand side there, that is when there is a base and the base is connected to the headstone by uh, metal spikes. And water and iron, you probably know, don't really mix very well. And as they expand and contract and the rust uh, takes hold, as water gets in, it'll split the stone and cause the stone to crack internally called iron jacking. And so these are not stones that I would encourage you to clean because they are not stable. They are coming uh, apart essentially and you want to preserve them uh, before you clean them. Uh, also other damages to look out for to take into consideration before you begin your cleaning, landscaping equipment, uh, mowers, weed eaters, weed whackers, whatever you call them in your part of the world. Um, they can create chips and any chips you see in a surface are a way for water to get in. And water is a, uh, an enemy of stone. Water created the Grand Canyon, it can definitely eat away at your stone. So, the, these are considerations, not just for your cleaning, but for your preservation. Then we also have vandalism of different sorts, theft, uh, breaking apart to get the metal to sell. These things will all create damages that you want to figure out, uh, uh, take a higher priority than cleaning them, them just cleaning them in, in itself. 
Um, we also have to look at repairs uh, for cleaning and for not doing. These are all things not to do. There are definitely, when I come to repairs, I always tell people if it's not just putting a stone back up in the ground and you don't have any training, um, don't do it. Have fundraisers, raise the money to hire someone because the situations that you see on the screen where they've been put together with inappropriate uh, materials, epoxies, wrong cement, encasing things so that water doesn't flow naturally or water gets trapped will create problems. And if you're adding additional water as you clean it to, to a stone that's already in a precarious position, you're just adding to the degradation to this, of, of the stone. So first of all, avoid all of the things you see on the screen. Those are all not great, but well-intentioned ideas. Um, and think about doing the re repairs on those particular stones and choosing other stones in the cemetery that um, are more stable to clean. Um, some people only want to clean stones because they can't read them. Um, and that is valid, especially because genealogy is a really big deal. Family histories are a big deal. Recording a cemetery so that it could be added to a national register or the state, uh, our North Carolina state site file is very important. So people will clean them to get to that. And that's, that's okay. Uh, it's better than doing some of the things you see on the screen. Um, the adding materials to the letters is not always the best idea because these things, uh, again, think of headstones like teeth. They might, any grit or wear that you add could become problematic, especially if you have lots of people doing it over time. Um, once may not be a problem, but you might not be the only person doing it. So you see some common ones like chalk, cornstarch, flour, uh, shaving foam, adding bleach to get places, uh, pieces wider, using power tools, uh, like uh, the brush, the Nilox, Nilox brushes on the end of a drill. All of those things make it readable initially, but they can do open up the stones to long-term problems. So really, especially in the 21st century, the best way to get at a, a, an inscription is to take a really good high quality photograph and then mess around with contrast and light in a photo editing software. And you'll get a lot uh, more detail than you may um, by rubbing a potentially problematic uh, substance into the headstone itself. Um, or you can instead choose a safe cleaning method I'm gonna talk about here in a minute and proceed from there. Or you can just run water over the stone and sometimes that will create enough contrast for you to be able to read it, just plain old water. All of these other fillers that I mentioned of are, can be problematic. And you think, well, they're cornstarch and chalk. Um, a lot of these things have either stuff in them or they have aspects to them that create problems. Um, whether they be the acids or the uh, chemicals in the material itself can eat away at, at the stone or the things like, uh, like I'm always surprised at how much garbage is in kids sidewalk chalk that you don't want to think about. Um, but also some items like the flowers or the, the household food type items, they work, but if you leave a speck of that behind, you're leaving it open to um, biological agents like uh, moss, uh, molds and um, lichens to latch onto that and eat that stuff. And that will eat into the stone, create fissures, allow water in and become problematic. Uh, of course, power washers, uh, hand tools, those are problematic because they will um, scratch off that nice skin uh, and that's protecting the surface of the stone and then uh, over time expose it to water and life and it'll just disappear and you will uh, not leave something for people who come after you to look at. And that's the most important thing in preservation is to ensure that these, res uh, these resources are there for you to study and use but for future generations to learn from as well. Uh, photography, some quick photography tips. Uh, I'm an archeologist and as an archeologist or a historian, documentation is really important. So uh, create either uh, some sort of 
whiteboard or these photo boards are popular. You can buy them at Target now to create a, uh, a, a memory of a record and a memory of where these uh, headstones are, especially if you're doing a whole cemetery. Take lots of pictures of each side uh, to get all the different inscriptions. And also uh, lots of these things have been tied together in the past, these images to create 3D models that can be useful and preserved, even if there's some sort of long-term damage to the head to, to the cemetery. Um, Mirrors or flashlights to cast light across headstone also help you take a create more le relief for a better picture. Now, some of the, the stains that you commonly see in a headstone in a cemetery on the headstones are things that you see uh, above. Um, lots of moles and mosses and lichens and tree saps that you see on the bottom. That black or orange staining is very prevalent, um, but also rusting and oxidation. Um, I, we live in the south here, so everything's slightly orange. Uh, so the groundwater from sprinkler systems can stain headstones and zoological staining you might see uh, in many areas, which in this case, in that picture are bird droppings. Um, all of these things have certain characteristics that you can look for. Um, and many of these can be addressed with normal cleaners or even just straight plain water. Uh, water, people think you need these fancy chemicals, but really water and a soft brush do a great job. So some of these cleaners that are appropriate are um, the sort of industry standard, sort of the gold star is the D2 biological solution is the biocide that works great to clean initially and then acts over time on biological materials like the mosses and the, and the, the lichens and things like that. Uh, these are some of the other uh, solutions that the, um, have been approved by different cemetery and NCPCT. Uh, that people like. Uh, a lot of these you have to order online. Um, they're not cheap, some of them, but again, straight water works great as well. Uh, tools always use soft, either plastic or natural bristle brushes. These will have the least impact on stone. I do not ever want to hear about a power washer or a grill brush being used on a headstone because that will create disaster. Uh, a lot of headstones have little details and that's where toothbrushes and bamboo skewers and popsicle sticks are great. A lot of water is necessary. If you do not have water on site, but you're doing a big cemetery cleaning, I'd recommend reaching out to your local either reservists or uh, if you have a military installation nearby, oftentimes they might be willing to bring one of those big water buffaloes, those big containers of water to your cemetery uh, to clean for a big public event. Um, so of course, cleaning is part of a long-term management strategy. So th this should not be the only thing you do in that cemetery. And if you are interested in learning more about management plans, I don't have time for that today, uh, but you can definitely reach out to me and we can chat about different things that you consider landscaping and trees uh, and access that should be a, an also important parts to your management plan. Also, document, document, document. There are forms online, such as Core Foundation has some that are publicly available. I can send you some if you uh, reach out to me uh, to document what you've done and what you plan to do, take pictures. All of these things become part of the history, the use and the life of the cemetery. More than just, uh, you know, these people are buried here and they came from here. The cemetery itself is also a place an entity and it has its own story. And these changes help over time. And then if something happens, say a big hurricane or something along those lines, a flood, um, an earthquake, if you're somewhere that where that happens, then you also have a document of what the last state of those headstones look like because you did it while you were cleaning. Also, if you do that in your North Carolina, send it to me. I'd love it to add it to the state record of that cemetery as well, uh, so that everyone has a copy. So I'm going to show you briefly a uh, video of the headstone. I'm not going to do the audio, just sort of the process. This is 
Jason Church from the NCPTT. Headstone cleaning requires a lot of water. So we have him here spraying down. It's really, it works that best, especially if you use some of the solutions if the stone is already very saturated. So spray the stone down very, uh, very thoroughly. Uh, then you can spray on your chemical. I like to use D2, which is nice because it's a great uh, acting material, but oh, my screen okay. is... Right yeah, screen. I just want you to know we can't see you right now, yeah. so you'll have to... I just realize that. Give me one second. Screen. One second. Okay. Uh, new share. New share. This one. My apologies. Nope, still not sharing. You share. We can see what says how to clean a gravestone, a stone grave marker. Okay, you can see that? There yes. we go. Okay. So yeah, he sprayed it very thoroughly with water. Um, now he sprayed on the chemical. D2 is great because uh, it's great on its own. I've also heard that you can cut it one to one uh, with water to make it last a little bit longer. Um, always start, you can see he's starting with the base and work your way towards the top. That helps avoid streaks. He is using his brushes and you can switch between brushes for different parts and make sure you rinse as you go so that none of the material, some of these say you can sort of spray and let it go and that is true, uh, but it's always best to continually rinsing it. You don't, especially in areas where there's a lot of temperature change between night and day. You don't wanna leave something wet that could be susceptible to expanding and contracting of the water to create uh, problems. So nice circular movements, uh, circular brush strokes will, um, uh, as you move upwards, will uh, create the, the best possible um, uh way to clean that headstone oops no so we move through here and almost done um but we're talking about some of these african-american cemeteries and between uh the the ones post-emancipation and especially the ones that are pre-emancipation headstones aren't the only thing that exists in these places so these things are also things that can be cleaned, but also things that you need to look out for when identifying these resources. Um, because the, a lot of these places, they had wooden markers or they had artifacts as markers, especially in pre-emancipation communities or newly emancipated communities. And all of these things are considered funerary elements and they are protected under North Carolina cemetery law. Um, so look for things uh, that, there could be fences or walls, depressions are a big deal, which might also indicate to you where stones, if they did exist, had fallen and are semi-buried that you can locate and clean and restore. Sometimes there are mounds. Um, sometimes we have field stones. And these are also, even though they don't have epitaphs on them, they're also valid things to clean. Uh, cinder blocks, personal items, um, the artifacts I would leave, but some of these hard materials like the cement blocks or the bricks or the field stones, those are all things that are considered markers and they are considered markers under North Carolina law and that they should be protected and preserved as well. Um, biological features, you, as you're doing your cleaning efforts, look out for non-native or unusual grasses that you see as you clear them away, know that under North Carolina law, because these things have been planted to act as markers, they are protected resources. So leave them be if you can. You can trim them back, but leave them in place because they could be the only thing left to memorialize a marker, especially if you consider a plant like periwinkle that spreads where it used to be maybe all over the place now, but if you pull it all back, where it was started out as the only marker may be lost. Uh, early, I was talking about um, uh, artifacts, shells, stones, even things like hubcaps, ceramic vessels, personal items, cups, quilts, 
glasses, all of these things that were personal items relate to African traditions that persisted in the Southeast um, well into the 20th and even 21st century in some communities. These things are, have been in the past seen as garbage and they have been tossed aside, but look very carefully because they could be markers. And these markers are protected also under North Carolina law. And if you are in the midst of a cleaning of a cemetery and you have questions about whether or not this is or not a marker or just trash, um, send me a, uh, an email or my, you'll see my, uh, on our website, my phone number, my work cell phone, you can text me a picture and I'll help you decide whether or not that is something that you should pick up or you should leave in place because it could be a funerary item. Um, here are more examples of what that looks like in the real world. Uh, everything from these items through uh, modern incarnations like those florist pebbles you see at the top right there. Um, and there's lots of cool information. We will be relaunching an African-American cemetery project page that will have African-American cultural or cemetery cultural identifiers very, very shortly. Um, here are some great resources to look for if you're looking for uh, about cleaning or about preservation. There's the not NCPTT. The Association for Gravestone Studies is an avocational group that I belong to, and you can all join if you are interested to learn more. The Core Foundation is a great group that has worked with African American cemeteries in the past, and they have they, they have great documents and forms that you can use or mirror. Um, and more about National Register there at the bottom. And then lastly, here's my contact information. If you are interested uh, in reaching out to me, our Facebook page and our web page, our cemetery page is being updated. It should be up uh, hopefully in the next week. And then the African American Cemetery webpage should be up in the next month. And you, there will be lots of links to new frequently asked questions about laws and cares and brochures and North Carolina cemetery forms to report your cemeteries to me. And I am way over time, so I am going to stop here. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, first of all, you gave us so much important, important, important information. Um, and again, it just reminds me of how vast and important a subject this is in terms of, you know, we all care but how do we care and making sure that we care with best practices and knowledgeably for these resources, these precious resources, incredibly important. Um, those of you who have your hands raised, I'd love to see it. What we're going to do with hands raised questions if they're, if, that you want to ask yourself is we're gonna hold those towards the end. If you have questions that, are, that you wanna write and there are quite a few that are already in the Q&A, we can have uh, Melissa, start to respond to some of those or some of our other experts respond to some of those as we move forward. Uh, for the moment, we are gonna bring up Jessica and Jessica will talk about that day of experience. And uh, so she'll speak for about 10 minutes on what it's like to go in there assessing the local conditions of your space. We'll be speaking specifically to Old Oak Grove Cemetery, which is where uh, we, uh, those of us who are in Elizabeth City and the vicinity will gather at some point um, when there's some better weather to clean. So we'll talk, uh, so Jessica will walk us through what that experience is in terms of just your personal preparation, being comfortable, uh, what to bring with you, that kind of thing. So uh, Jessica, come on up and uh, you'll speak. Uh, in the meantime, Melissa and others, feel free to jump in to the Q&A and to the chat to respond to questions. And after Jessica speaks, we'll open up the floor and I'll call on folk who have their hands raised and also uh, uh, read out some of the questions that may have not yet been responded to in the Q&A. So Jessica. Hi, thank you, Dr. Stuckey. I'm also going to share my screen. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I um, have previously participated in cemetery conservation projects. So I wanted to take a moment to share some practical tips um, for um, our work day when we are able to reschedule it. Um, so before you arrive on site, let's consider the following. As uh, Melissa Timo pointed out, 
Documentation and photography are important tools when preserving these sites. Luckily, a lot of us have powerful cameras built into our smartphones, which will record metadata like the where we are, um, the date, things like that. Um, and I know we are often really eager to start the cleaning process, um, but remember to, if you can, just to take a quick snapshot, even if it's just your phone, you don't have super fancy camera equipment. Um, so take a snapshot of the marker before you begin, and then uh, once you're done with your final rinse, try to replicate that photo so you can have that direct comparison of the before and after. And at the very least, um, those two photos will provide a record of that marker's condition, um, which can be used as a future reference point. Um, with those photos, we can more easily track changes in the marker over time. Um, further, if anyone is interested in pursuing the heritage profession, um, these images can be a really important part of a portfolio for yourself. Um, so make sure you charge your phone the night before so you can be prepped with a full battery when you arrive. Um, also, I know there are some of us uh, who fo whose phones may just crash when they try to take a photo. I've definitely been guilty of that. Um, luckily, disposable cameras are still available and that can also be a wonderful um, tool for documenting this type of work. Um, so when you are able to gather, um, please bring a trash bag with you. Um, any size will do. Removing litter while we're there can go a long way towards sustaining the site. A good deal of preservation work is preventative maintenance, uh, meaning we can help prolong the permanence of this place by currently investing our time and energy in removing debris and other invasive items. Um, again, back to uh, Ms. Timo's point, there is a distinction to be made between memorial objects left by loved ones and refuse. Um, and as she said, she is happy to be a, a resource um, for us uh, when the time comes. Um, another task um, that you could potentially be performing is weeding, just like you would do in a garden. Um, over time, grasses, leaves, and other plant growth can obscure markers. Um, and it's important to um, carefully uh, remove that vegetation by hand um, so we don't risk damaging the marker that lies below the surface. Um, we will have disposable nitrile gloves for you on site, um, but if you already have gardening or other uh, durable work gloves, um, include them in your kit for your work day. Also, knee pads um, or any other type of protective cushion may provide relief during the work day. Um, just be careful to not place any padding directly on a marker as that material could transfer to it. Um, okay, what to wear? Um, we are still currently experiencing a pandemic and even though we are, would be outdoors and easily able to practice social distancing, um, we still need to take the proper precautions and um, wear a face mask. Um, also important, uh, we had to make a decision uh, today in regards to the weather. So that's something when you are planning these days, um, keep an eye out on the weather forecast and make sure to um, wear clothes that you won't mind getting dirty. Um, finally, uh, closed toe shoes are a necessity. If you have something with a reinforced toe box um, or a thicker sole, all the better. Um, and to emphasize the need for proper footwear, let's take a look at some hazards you can expect to encounter, um, at least here in Elizabeth City. Um, so I took uh, the following photos uh, throughout uh, the week um, in preparation uh, for this. So unfortunately, um, there are all several markers um, like this um, that are similarly cracked or broken. Um, and as, uh, doc, as Ms. Timo um, said, you know, for your safety, um, just avoid those areas. Um, if uh, this is something you're interested in, um, if cemetery cleanup is something you're interested in doing um, on a regular basis, um, you may want to contact your healthcare provider about a tetanus shot um, because there is rusted metal that you will experience um, or come across um, during this type of activity. Um, so if you, I think it's every 10 years you can get a tetanus shot and then a booster. Um, so you may want to look into that. Um, and most of the items uh, that you'll encounter, they don't, they don't pose an immediate threat to us. Um, but I did observe 
some shards of glass on this site. So you want to be um, mindful in picking up litter. So this is towards the back of Old Oak Grove um, and just behind Oak Grove runs um, Charles Creek and there's a bit of a bank and you can see there's underbrush um, before you get to the, the water itself. And you can just see over time the, the wind um, and other elements have kind of moved what was maybe formerly at a, um, at a graveside and unfortunately um, has gotten caught in this underbrush. Um, so hopefully um, that is something that we can remedy when we do have our, uh, our work day. Um, again, this is an active burial ground. Um, so be aware of um, those spots where a lot of soil has recently been shifted. Um, and you can see here that this was, I believe, Thursday afternoon, um, and there is even more flooding now from all the rain that we've been getting um, this week. Um, I and mean, you can see here, this is, uh, there are several markers that are actually totally submerged in the water. Um, and this is the material culture that, you know, we are at risk of losing. Um, so I really hope you can join us um, so we may begin trying to, to mitigate um, these factors. Um, finally, uh, this is very specific to uh, Northeast North Carolina, um, but here are some local resources. Um, you can get more information regarding the history and care of uh, US cemeteries or the lives of the people interred there, plus my contact information. I'm also a local resource to Elizabeth City. Um, so if you have any questions um, regarding the topics I covered today, um, potentially joining our museum membership program, or if you're interested in entering the cultural field, um, please reach out. I would love to speak with you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Jessica, and also Melissa. So there, let's check out the Q&A. It looks like just about everything in there may be resolved. So I think what I'll do is I will look at, see who whose hands are currently raised, if any. We've got a few folks, uh, Mary Jones Fitz and Galaxy J7 Crown who have their hands up. So I'm going to allow you to talk by clicking on that button and seeing what happens. Mary. So you should unmute yourself. Okay, and we'll do the same with Galaxy J7 Crown. Um, both of you, if you could unmute yourselves, um, we can get you. Let's see. And Freddie Cooper has now opened up his. So Freddie Cooper, you are also allowed to talk. So we'll just see who comes up first in terms of hearing you. Open up your microphones. You're all muted at the moment. Okay, so maybe uh, Dr. Reed, if you can help us kind of figure that out. Freddie Cooper is elated, Ms. Cooper. I was very interested in learning about the different rules because I had a project in Colorado, but I live in Utah. So I didn't realize you had to you know, know different laws from different rules about cemeteries. And I just wanted to make that comment. So I'm so happy to be in this session with you all. Yeah, the, the rules are, are very different from place to place, which is kind of frustrating. Um, but it, it there are, it, at least I know North Carolina's rules that are, are very particular that are broad enough that will help us encompass some of these, especially the early African American and African uh, uh, enslaved community <coughs> cemeteries to protect them. But it is sort of hit or miss. I know because I've worked with uh, Mr. Perry in Tennessee that their laws are definitely different than North Carolina laws. So always check with your 
local state and your local county and your local city ordinances before you begin something because you might be surprised what's in there to help you or to something that you might not to might need to bring up and get changed in your community so that there is more protection. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, is there anyone else we've got? Okay, we've got Tom Marine. So I'm going to allow you to talk and please unmute your microphone. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay, I got a question. Uh, have you ever used arborist to come into the cemetery to help identify which tree should be cut down and that type of thing? Yes. I tell people before they begin their cleaning, as they're starting to develop a management plan, trees should be at the top of your list before headstones, because if trees fall, then there will not be headstones for you to clean. Uh, yes. So definitely consider, and trees are very expensive. Picking down a tree can be almost $10,000 sometimes. So I definitely recommend if you can, especially if you're in an area where there is a lot of tree cover, um, look out for your trees. Also important because trees can be markers, not just corner posts, but they can be actual markers themselves or these kind of cool trees that are often referred to colloquially as witness trees, where they have been there since the beginning. And you, it's, it's kind of important. Culturally speaking, as, as a, looking at it as a co cohesive landscape to keep those trees around because they are also much like the remains and the headstones, they're vestiges of the community that came before us that started this cemetery. So yes, bring in an arborist, uh, especially an arborist, not just a tree trimmer, bring in an arborist to look at the health of your trees to see if there are any needs that need to be addressed. And then if they need to be taken down or if uh, like what's happened in North Carolina, our hurricanes come through and blown over trees, there are definitely ways to approach tree trimming and tree removal once that has happened because trees grow in the path of least resistance. And in a cemetery, the path of least resistance is a nice turn grave uh, shaft. So it's very important to be very thoughtful in the removal and the, um, the health, uh, the looking after the health of your trees. So bring in someone who knows about that more than just someone who can take up the limbs, uh, which is also important because you don't want any of your visitors to get hurt either. But yes, arborist, very important. Okay, thank you. So right now, that those are the only two live questions we have. I'll take a quick look at the Q and A. We have a question and this may be one that several folks can answer. So other panelists, feel free to jump in. Uh, the question is, what can younger people do to contribute to the effort to care for cultural sites? Or could someone speak to the importance of collecting family histories? Why don't we start with uh, Angela with this one and then we'll see if Dr. Tariq wants to join after that. Sure, I'm going to, just for the purposes of today's conversation, speak to what younger people can do to contribute to preserving cemeteries. Um, young people are great, right? Uh, this information often is really, really compelling to them. So educating them on history of African-American burial grounds, um, why so many are in the state that they're in, um, tends to be, um, again, informative and exciting to young people. Um, I, I look young, but I'm not as young as I used to be once. And so <laughs> young people are great for, for getting out in the cemetery to clean, right? So to do that heavy lifting, to work in um, sun and different elements, to do some of those cleanings um, based on you know suggestions that Melissa and Jessica gave us. Um, young people, I think, are also great at helping to do some of that documentation work. Uh, they have computers in their pockets, right? And they are expert photographers, experts at documenting this information, um, even over social media. So getting them out there, you know, to, to take those pictures and to um, 
help organize all of that information using different technology is a great way um, to, to activate young people specifically to care for um, cemeteries. So that's what, what I'll offer now. Dr. Tariq, do you have anything? Yes, I'm actually going to add to the aspect of family history. Um, there are many questions I have to ask my great grandmother who was born in 1915 and my grandparents was born in 1930 because after I watch all these documentaries, I want to know if you've been there, did you, do you know these people? What type of music did you listen to growing up and all of these type things. But I think more importantly is being able to create the family archive while your family members are alive. So that way you can know where and how to collect the information that you're looking for. And you should just really start with the basis, right? Such as the hospitals they were born in, the cities they were born in, um, birth certificates, um, high school yearbooks are very important. When I go in the books, the used bookstore in Portsmouth, whatever yearbook of the five high schools I do not have, um, I started collecting them because you know, you have community members that move away, then you have those who get older and they give you a reference to that particular time period. I would collect, I would collect everything. Um, newspaper articles, I read old newspapers of the local area. That gives me a very good understanding um, what occurred during that particular time period. If you go to the Library of Congress website, they actually have a genealogy page up there. Um, and I think is, I can't remember their name, but there are quite a few African American genealogy journals that are out there as well and societies. And they're usually governed by a national body with local chapters. So I would just start within your immediate family and just start collecting all of the material culture on your family members. So to include oral history. Now, when you start doing genealogy, you may find out some things that you don't wanna find, all right? So there may be, um, your uncle may actually be your father, all right? And all of those type of things. So you are kind of unearthing the past right that is still alive in the present and that is this is sometimes why your family members may not want to respond to the question that you ask all right but that's just kind of part of um what we would do as researchers and i can also really um explain to you how to do a, a interview with a family member and what you should do when you get into those sticky situation. But I also have the experience that as your family members get older, they want to tell you things. They want you to know their life experiences, how you are connected to them, um, and maybe just other information that they just may not have thought that you was ready at the time when you were much younger than them, right? When you when, when they consider you their kids, but now they can consider you a you know, and an adult. So that's, I would stop there, but really starting with your family and within your community is the best place for you to start and simply by start collecting all of the references to the fam, to your immediate family members. I would also like to add that once you have this sort of information, think about repositories to collect it. Having it within your family is amazing and important but think about people over time and how some people aren't. Is In my family, there's definitely a team history and a team not history. And team history, we're gonna keep that stuff forever. But what happens when my sister and I aren't there anymore and that stuff goes away? Um, that's the mm -hmm. same thing with the recording of cemeteries too. If there is a state, especially a higher level, like a state level entity that will take your information, please do that. We don't know where some of these resources are and help protect them if we don't 
have people who will tell us that they are. For example, in North Carolina, there's the, the site file, a collection of archeology span sites, historic sites and cemeteries that people can submit sites to. Um, I'm gonna drop the link to the cemetery webpage, the archeology span webpage um, for North Carolina in the chat there. We have forms, we have a form called the Citizen Cemetery Form. It's a, uh, an easier public friendly form that you can fill out with details about the cemetery. But also if you have photos from people that are buried there, histories of the area, anything that has to tie into that cultural landscape, pack that all in the file, send it to me. So not only will your family and your community have a copy, but the state will have a backup copy and we can add the location of the cemetery or the resource to our state maps. So when the DOT comes to do a project or there's some sort of development, we have a pin on the map of that place so that we can help mitigate to prevent damage uh, to, that, to that resource. And I like to joke that everybody's auntie knows where the cemetery is, but once she passes away, there is no way for us to know and to get ahead of problems that could happen uh, without people reporting it to us. So please, please, please send me a form. And even if the cemetery has already been recorded, I'll just call that an update and add it to the file um, because this is, it is very important for uh, us to know as um, all inhab human inhabitants of our particular corners of the world to know about our local history, uh, but it also is helpful from a managerial standpoint um, as a state entity to help look at our resources and say, okay, what do we have and how can we help? Um, so always consider bumping your information up to the highest level possible um, because we want it. We want it so badly uh, so that we know where this stuff is too. So I wanna reiterate a little bit of what uh, Melissa just said um, from the perspective of someone who is a historian who's learning about <clears throat> the networks of preservation and how those interact with the state. So one of the first conversations I had with her, I said, well, what about find a grave? Isn't that you know, adequate in terms of uh, documentation? And you know, it's not because it's not connected to the state and that's the way that you protect the resource, right? So it's great for information for me, but in terms of protecting the property, protecting the site from construction and road building, et cetera, it needs to be known by the state. And I feel that in North Carolina, uh, we're incredibly fortunate to have, like I said, these are, my, these are my people right here, right? Like that we have some folk who are committed on a personal and a professional level to making sure that we care for these resources. Um, and I'm sure that those people exist in other states as well. So look for them. Um, we, you know, we have the, the, the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, which is the wheelhouse for the Office of State Archaeology for the North Carolina African American Commission and for all of the museums, the state museums and other sites, right? So we've got these great resources who we see coming together in a space like this, but reach out to folk, uh, whether it's starting at your, your regional museum or your state museum and ask questions if you're not sure who it is to reach out to. Reach out to your state archeologist, Re reach out to the Department of Transportation. Somebody is gonna be able to help point you in the direction that you need to get the right information about who needs to know about this cemetery. Uh, so I really, I appreciate so much uh, the expertise and uh, the encouragement to reach out to our state officials, our state workers, and various departments and offices so we, that we can begin this work or continue this work of preservation. I have a question that's a, a, almost a reference question that, and I know that we also have some, we have incredible people that are, uh, that are, are participants. So someone may be able to respond to this question in the chat, um, some of our Library of Congress folk perhaps. Uh, so this is the question. In Conroe Community C Cemetery, I think this is in Texas, we are restoring, uh, we are restoring, we have four persons who were a part of the Knights and in Daughters of Tabor International Order of 12. In Texas, there is not much information on this organization. Uh, do you have any resources that we could use uh, to learn more about the organization? I have the manual. 
which can be found online, but I can't find any records of members in local societies. I suspect that that's going to be directed to your local genealogical and local historical societies and local museums, but I thought that I would say that one out loud in case that there is someone in uh, some participant who has expertise to share about that. Uh, also so that local universities too. sometimes they'll have a special collections with local history that you can reach out to them as well. Thank you. Yes. Let's add them to the resources as well. State Library. So uh, it, it will require some digging. Um, one resource that historians love to use is called WorldCat, and someone can probably type the web address for WorldCat in the chat for us. Uh, and that is, uh, a, you know, a catalog, a card catalog of many, 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 many libraries, which is why it's called WorldCat. So that may be a way to find where um, some of the knights and daughters of, of Tabor um, records might be kept. Uh, so please feel free to do that. Let's see. Um, I think someone may have responded to Ms. Catrice's response uh, question. So we've got some hands up. Let's see. Who can we call on right now? Melissa, I wanted to um, speak to a couple of things. So one, um, I wanted to add to what some of our folks were sharing about genealogical resources. So Dr. Tariq mentioned the Library of Congress. In the chat, Dr. Nadia Orton posted um, a link to the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. That is a nationwide organization that does uh, Black genealogy, and there are local chapters everywhere, including in North Carolina. There are several local chapters of that society. So you can scroll back up to that link and find your local chapter. I also see some conversation happening about laws at the federal and at the state level. Earlier, I posted in the chat um, a link to the African American Burial Grounds Network Act. That was attempted legislation that was, um, that was legislation that was um, attempted to be passed at the federal level to help protect African American burial grounds. I'll note that that bill did die in Congress. And so this is where it comes time to flex your muscle as a constituent. If you would like to see that bill reintroduced, pick up that phone. Our Congresswoman, Congresswoman Alma Adams was responsible for putting that bill forward a couple of years ago. So if that's something you would like to see again, pick up that phone as one of her constituents and call that office. The same thing at the state level. Virginia uh, has a really great model for how they have um, allocated funding to some burial grounds, African-American burial grounds in their state. We would love to see the same thing in North Carolina. But guess what? As a state employee, I cannot ask for a bill. But guess who can? You all can as constituents. So again, this is another time. If you would like to see something in North Carolina at the state level to protect our African-American burial grounds, pick up the phone and start talking to your legislators. They can listen to you as constituents. So those are just some um, tips for me, especially if you'd like to see some teeth behind this in the form of laws. Thank you so much, Angela. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Angela is, is limiting our chat and making sure that some of the comments, which were really valuable, I had intended to ask about the state of the legislation. So. Um, if you haven't written in the chat about that specifically, I think that that would be really valuable to put some links about what the legislation is all about and why we need to revive that. Uh, so I have given permission to Alia Jones and to Veronica Downing, and I think that both of you are unmuted. So uh, Ms. Jones, why don't you start and then Ms. Downing. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Um, so. I was thinking about the fact that a lot you're a lot of you are based in the Carolinas and you know you have the Eastern Band Cherokee, you have the Lumbee. So I was wondering if you can talk about any situations where African burial grounds kind of overlap with native burial grounds or reservation land, and if there's any type of co-work happening um, to preserve and protect those spaces that overlap culturally. Yes. 
Um, we, uh, that is definitely a possibility knowing the history of both the communities involved. Um, and we are, have this, uh, like uh, Angela mentioned, her office and my office has had this initiative since uh, April, 2019 that we've been moving forward on this project. Um, I, we're actually presenting at the, um, the Native American conference, which happens at the beginning of next month about uh, laying the groundwork to establish a simil similar project, a uh, community-based project with a Native American community in North Carolina, um, which obviously means that they might, those efforts might overlap. Um, but that is possible um, in North Carolina, and North Carolina law protects all cemeteries and burials, regardless of where they are on public or private lands. So they're all protected regardless. Um, and there are laws that back up the destruction and vandalism and things like that for prosecution purposes. Um, but that is another initiative that my office is beginning to pursue. Um, working with communities though, I don't, if anyone, anyone who has worked with, uh, done community outreach projects in the past is, the key is building slow um, uh, mutual partnerships. So the first uh, with the African-American workshops, we're doing fairly well. I, it's slow and tedious, like Angela mentioned, but I think we're making some really good momentum in the state. Um, and now we're just beginning this with the, the Native American community in North Carolina, um, because it is also another underrepresented and neglected uh, corner of um, North Carolina cultural resources. So that is something that we're working on in this state I don't know what it's like in other states, but we that is definitely a, a project that's starting in North Carolina. Thank you. Uh, so Veronica, if you go ahead. So we can, I can see that your mic is open, but we can't quite hear you. Is that you now? Is that Veronica? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, my headphones were in. Um, what I wanted to know is what should be done if the headstone that we are preserving is on family land or um, air property? Like for example, the um, story that I did for um, private Jonathan Overton, that headstone was on what I found was a family plot and I had to get that information from the county um, courthouse and their um, lands and titles um, department. And since then, they've only um, kept the grounds of that area um, for the past few years. And just recently, another headstone for another historical figure had been found and they placed the updated um, headstone on that same land. So I was wondering what would have to be done, what um, protections would have to be made in order to preserve those headstones and still respect the family or who, um, whose land that is. There are, um several parts to your question. Uh, does that, uh, do, it's all about the land ownership. Um, now under North Carolina law, general statutes that govern um, uh, cemeteries in North Carolina, um, there are two statutes about accessing a cemetery. Uh, it, even if it's on private property, there are general statutes 65-101 and 65-102. And under the, that legal language, a descendant, a designee of a descendant, or an interested party may have a, a reasonable access to a cemetery on private land, even if they don't own it, to discover, restore, maintain, or visit, I believe the language goes, but don't quote me on that. Uh, we, I can link to the particular laws for you to read to your, for yourself. The key is, um, having a discussion with the landowner to say, what's the best way for me to access this part of your property? Um, 
we plan on coming at this date. This is our, these are our plans because it is private property and you want to give them a heads up, especially if the cemetery is in a field, a farmer's field or something along those lines or behind somebody's house. It's important to give them a heads up. And 65-102 is the avenue to pursue if that property owner is being honorary or there's a, a disagreement about what reasonable access looks like uh, using the, the, the local county's clerk of courts to sort of mediate how that access would work. Now, under North Carolina law, there is nothing that requires a property owner to do any maintenance or to do any restoration of a cemetery on their property. Um, there are lots of lo things that they can't do, like plow over, destroy, deface, um, any of those type of things, but there's nothing legally requiring a property owner to care for it. But there is avenues, legal avenues for if there is a descendant or a group that wants to restore a headstone in a cemetery on a piece of property, there are legal avenues in North Carolina to follow to make that happen. So it, 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 it depends. So much of archeology span and history and historic preservation is it depends, but that's roughly how it works in North Carolina. And to give a little bit of background um, about Jonathan Overton and Veronica. So Veronica Downing is one of our history students, history majors at ECSU. And she's also a talented journalist and uh, researched and wrote and published a piece in the Chowan Herald, I believe, about Jonathan Overton, who was an African-American veteran of the, um, of the American Revolution, right? So we're talking uh, an incredible story. And for her to have uh, discovered his headstone and to put together some of that story, she shared that information with me in, our, in one of our classes uh, last year. And we were able to discover a little bit more information towards Overton's story. So uh, he's certainly uh, one of the more interesting figures in uh, Edenton, which is where uh, Veronica is from and where he was buried uh, for us to learn information about. So thank you so much for asking that question for Veronica. Um, it's an important one. And I think it's one that impacts a lot of us. If you drive just around any town, including Elizabeth City, you'll see a headstone or two uh, in what is essentially an empty lot. Uh, I was just showing Jessica one <laughs> between our, what I would call our cemetery avenue uh, in Elizabeth City. There are, are three or four cemeteries, but there's also a few headstones that are in, in groves of trees. And I'm you know, very curious about them. So we have those all over the place. Um, in, a, in, the, in the US and I'm sure in other places as well. Uh, and we all often wonder, uh, there's an incredible story that I can share about John Hope Franklin, who is the, was an esteemed historian um, in North Carolina for many years. His family is originally from Oklahoma and that's the place where I do my research. And they were former slaves of Native Americans in Oklahoma. And at the time that his ancestors were buried, the land was held in common uh, by I believe the Choctaw Nation. And after statehood and the land, uh, around the time of statehood, the land was privatized. And he, his father has an autobiography, his, his father's name is B.C. Franklin, where he, uh, John Hope Franklin's father is B.C. Franklin, where he writes about the fact that he um, no longer has access to, nor really knows where his parents and his grandparents are buried. And he muses um, more knowledgeably, knowledgeably than I realized at the time, but he muses that they're probably in someone's cow field. Uh, well, you know, however many years later, sometime in the early 2000s, I'm doing uh, research on my dissertation and I often am doing genealogical research and I find someone in Oklahoma has posted photographs of headstones in their cow field and it's the names of John Hope Franklin's ancestors. Now, this was in the early 2000s and I live in regret every day that I do not remember the website. I didn't download all the pictures. I didn't email the person right away. But that is the case, I think, for so many of our stories is we do move, as Angela talked about in the beginning of our conversation. Uh, things happen and we lose access to the land. We are no longer the property owners of the land. And it's, I think this is the reason why we are gathered together today and people are gathered across the country in the, in 
you know, across international borders as well, trying to reconnect with those pieces of our personal past and also to bring together those pieces of our community past. So I really wanna commend everyone um, and thank everyone who is doing that kind of work in their local community. Thank you so much for participating in this particular uh, mini conference. Um, I'm really looking forward to our opportunity locally to do a community communal uh, cleaning of Old Oak Grove and uh, to take care of some of our civil African American Civil War veterans headstones, as well as the grave site of um, our university founder, Hugh Kale. Uh, so that's something that we are looking forward to do. And I believe I really believe that there is a groundswell of interest to make this an annual event um, in terms of that kind of care work. So uh, before I close out, I just wanna check to make sure that uh, the chat looks clear in terms of conversation. It does look clear. I want to note one more thing before we close. Um, there are a lot of North Carolina groups in the chat and questions around how do we connect with one another? Who's on Instagram documenting their progress? Um, and so I think what Melissa and I can do is we said at the beginning, we are working to put together some resources that you can find on um, archaeology and the commission's webpage in the next few months. But what we can also start doing um, is putting together a list of who we know is doing the work so that folks can start connecting with each other. So keep an eye on the African American Heritage Commission's webpage. We hope to get those lists up by the summer. There are some other groups like in Florida, there's the, the Florida Public Archaeology Network has the cemetery resource protection training uh, that they do their own cemetery training, the crypt training, which I think is very clever. Um, but out of that, because of so many people participating, they've developed their own Facebook group uh, for people to share. And that's something that I have uh, figured, would like to, to try to figure out because it's, you know, sharing not only information and progress, but also helping each other out to say, we're gonna go out on Saturday. Is anyone in Pitt County? Does anyone in Buncombe County uh, wanna come out to help us do this? Then there's a pool of resources of people who are also passionate like you, um, because it's always better to rely on each other and uh, finding your people and, and, and lifting each other up. So that's definitely something, yeah, keep an eye out. It's yeah, coming. it's coming. We can make that happen. And thank you all for helping us to, to understand what we need to do. Uh, we're excited to respond. So thank you, everyone, everyone for coming, for listening, for, for sharing. Um, I am really excited to read the chat transcript and uh, jot down email addresses. And, you know, we have a list of everyone who, part, who signed up. Uh, so I am so grateful. This has been an, an incredible day. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you so much, Latif. Also, uh, we have our, my quiet partner. Thank you, Chaz Reed, who is you know, my co-chair uh, on the Black History Month Committee at ECSU. Uh, Latif is in, uh, on our committee as well. This was, um, this was a lot of work, but it was so worth it. And we just, it, I feel the energy growing. Um, one thing that you can look forward to us uh, at ECSU is we, this is a totally different topic, but I have a feeling we could do a whole mini conference on this as well. We have a Rosenwald School on our campus and we have just been awarded funding to begin the process of rehabilitating that building and making it something that can be used for uh, gathering, you know, when we were safe to gather again, uh, to have conversations exactly like this one. Um, so I'm going to close things out. Uh, Ms. Cooper, uh, let's just check qu quickly because I do, if this is something that she can, uh, that can be responded to by the group, I don't want to lose that opportunity for her. Go ahead, Ms. Cooper. You have to unmute yourself though. I was just trying to reach the chat to thank all of you for this very important and interesting um, program today. 
Thank you so much. I actually really appreciate hearing one voice of that since we can't have everyone communicating in that way. So thank you so much, Ms. Cooper, for speaking for so many folks in the chat in that gratitude to the panel for their hard work. Uh, and we will be in touch. This is not the last time you will hear from us. So look for us on Twitter, look for us on Facebook. The uh, recording of this will be on Facebook and we will be sending links to people. So this, community, this, this conversation is just beginning. Thank you all so very much. Have a great rest of your day. I didn't intend to do that. No.